Um, in a real sense, you know, strong transnational criminal organizations are competing with uh, weak state governments for capacity and legitimacy in the region. Uh, for instance, we see no-go zones uh, across the region where governments are simply not in charge uh, and the cartels or the gangs are. Um, how do we improve the capacity and legitimacy of the state while diminishing the capacity and legitimacy of these organizations? That's a tough question. I think by having, I think by having territorial, it's, it's, I think it's a matter of territorial control. Actually, you know what? I think that's a good idea. Daniel, why don't you give a full answer and okay. uh, I'll ask some other questions to you. Okay. <laughs> I think that I was saying that it's a, I think it's a matter of territorial control. Why is there so much production of coca crops and cocaine in some parts of Colombia where there are where there is no state presence? And I think the answer is a political answer because there are no votes there. No politician has an incentive to bring a school, to bring a, a hospital, anything there. So the the politicians have no incentive to have territorial control over some areas in Colombia. So how do we induce politicians to have an incentive to have to bring development to these regions, to Putumayo, to Caquetá, to different regions in Colombia where there is nothing, just coca production, uh, cocaine processing labs, and that's it. There are no votes there. So we have to find incentives so that politicians care for the votes that are in those regions. Uh, and that that will bring state le legitimacy. Le legitimacy. Uh, Daniel, I want to ask you uh, actually another question. Um, uh, you're in an unusual situation. Uh, you know, uh, you've spent uh, the vast majority of your career in the academic world, uh, and you've recently trans uh, transitioned to uh, a uh, political and governmental leadership role. Um, I'd love to hear uh, a little bit about uh, your experiences in that regard and how, now that you're in at least, at least partly a driver's seat, um, how do you bring research and science to bear? I think when we are in, 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 in academia, we all talk about evidence-based policies, that we have to construct evidence-based policies. And when you get there, there is not much time, first, to get bored, and second, to think. So you have to very fa very quickly uh, implement policies and make decisions without having much time to think. Where you in academia, you have a lot of time. You have two years to write a paper. We have uh, we have papers with Joao that have been there for five or six years, and we haven't finished. So is, is that a dig? Is Joao? I think I think in Latin, what we have to do in academia is not trying to reinvent the wheel. We have to bring things that have worked in other uh, scenarios, adapt them to, to countries like Colombia, to Brazil, to Venezuela, uh, and then try to implement them as best as we can and with impact evaluations. That's what we are doing in Bogota, for instance, with a hotspots policing experiment, where we not only increase policing time in, in hotspots in Bogota, but we also bring uh, public services, uh, street lighting, uh, trash collection, and we've done this in a spirit where we have, of course, a, a randomized control trial where we intervene some uh, some hotspots. We don't some others, and those are randomly selected. And as as much as we can, we should try to bring evaluations. and And if the results are bad, just take back those policies and 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 accept that and and bring better policies to to try to reduce crime. Thank you. So. Uh, Final question uh, uh, to the whole panel. Uh, you know, the U.S. has uh, obviously played a significant role uh, in these issues uh, across the region, uh, for better and sometimes for worse. Um, we've had an election here in the United States, and with the new incoming administration, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, the U.S. role uh, in the region with regard to these issues? Uh, you know, uh, what what uh, what do you expect from the new administration uh, moving forward? And uh, aside from what you expect, what would you like to see from the new administration? Uh, and why don't we begin, uh, Zhao, with you, and then we'll uh, work back. 
I'm going to be re really short because I, I think it, uh, the time is better spent with uh, Stephen and, and, and Daniel on this one because from my experience that comes from Brazil, the, the, it's not that the U.S. plays a big role in, in this issue. So uh, I, I, obviously, I, just like anyone else, I, don't, I hope for not so crazy things. <laughs> not so crazy things. <laughs> it's a good baseline. Um, I, I, I don't think that the president cares at all about Latin America and the Caribbean. That's where I would start, and those would be my, my list of five things that he would write down about Latin America and the Caribbean. Number six would be that I'm going to delegate it to the very important point people that he has, so I'm very, uh, I'm very interested in who becomes Secretary of State, obviously, because that is certainly a person that can, can direct policy. So, and you've got these incredibly different candidates, this array of candidates in front, so I'm not sure. Um, even with that in, in mind, I think that most of these policies uh, are working on inertia. These are years-long policies. They take years to sort of put into place. Um, and I think that there are a lot of political mess – there's a lot of political messaging that could change as it relates to, for example, military police in a place like Honduras or a militarized approach towards uh, drug traffickers in a place like Mexico. That sort of messaging could change, but I think in general terms, the policy will stay the same. <laughs> and, and, and Daniel abstains. <laughs>